Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by doctors Robin Gregory and Brooke Moore. Uh, Dr. Gregory is adjunct professor at the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. And Dr. Moore is a district principal in Delta Schools and also an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia. And today we're talking about their book, Sorting It Out, Supporting Teenage Decision Making. So Dr. Gregory, Dr. Moore, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. It's great to be here today. And um, I'm coming in, zooming in from the lands of the Tuasin and the Musqueam on the west coast of what is now known as Canada. And over to you, Robin, where are you coming in from? I'm coming in from near uh, what's now the town of Seashell, but the Seashell Nation and the Coast Salish peoples who've lived here for uh, thousands and thousands of years and have kept this environment very beautiful. So, Yeah, and it's just important for us to, to do that because most of our province is um, on unceded territory, actually. And so just want to raise our hands and offer respect. So tell us first, what is the premise of your book and what goals did you have in mind when writing it? Well, the I premise think, of um, our book... Yeah. Oh, you go. Yeah, no, you go. You go, Brooke. <laughs> <laughs> the premise of our book is um, basically a model, a six-phase model for decision-making. And it's um, based in science and it's really aimed at the everyday user. Um, primarily, the book is written for adults who live or work with youth anybody between 10 and 25, I'd say, broadly speaking, um, to help them make good decisions, thoughtful, intentional decisions in their lives. Since you're talking here in the book specifically about teenagers, what would you say are perhaps the aspects of decision making that are the most important to understand and target in teenagers specifically? So t I think we pick teenagers well, partly because of the work that Brooke and I have done with many fantastic teachers in schools, which focuses on, on kids uh, sort of between 12 and 18, and then yeah. also in the university. But, um, you know, that's an age where you move from having other people make decisions for you to where you have to make decisions yourself. Right. And there's basically nothing much taught in schools about uh, what does that mean to make a good decision? We learn about math, we learn about social sciences, we learn about, but we don't learn about decision making. And yet I can't think of anything more important for uh, for anyone to know, teenagers, adults, um, than how to make good choices and what that what that means. So I think by focusing on teenagers, they're they're at that point where there's still many teenagers eager to learn, their minds are open, their minds are developing. But they're making these choices, little choices and big choices that will really shape their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think the best way to shape your life is through uh, making good choices. So I think we wanted to focus on that age and write a book really for the adults who live or work with teens, as Brooke said, because many adults don't, they, they tell their kids, well, make a good choice, make good choices, make good decisions. They have no idea what that means. They don't really know. I essentially a good decision would be what they want. And Brooke and I both really feel strongly that a good decision should be what the compatible with the teenagers values. Who is this person? They're finding out who they are. Um, it should be their values, their personality, their agency, which really shapes it, their decisions, not some rules that are developed from from outside. And basically what kids get are, are rules for good behavior. And we want a process for good decisions. It's quite different. So that's a long-winded answer. <laughs> so in the book, you go through six different decision maker moves. We're going to talk about them, but uh, just to introduce them and also to ask you how you got at these six decision maker moves specifically. So they are frame the decision, clarify the matters, generate options, explore consequences, weight trade-offs, prioritize and choose, and the final one, stay curious and learn. So why 
uh, the uh, these six decision maker moves specifically. Brooke, you take this one. Okay, um, those six decision maker moves are based in the decision sciences, which, um, and it comes from a model uh, developed by Ralph Keeney and and some others um, called the PROACT model. But we wanted something that was more um, plain language, some words that would be really easily understood by by youth and by um, people who aren't in the decision making sciences. Um, and we developed them with um, some colleagues of Robbins, uh, Lee Failing and Graham Long, and um, some teachers that I work with in Delta. And so through that collaboration um, and a lot of back and forth, we, we landed on those six moves. Um, did you want us to describe what those six moves are? Uh, yes, we're going to go through which of them, but what are the main goals with these decision maker moves? I mean, what effects do you expect them to have mm. on teenagers' psychology? So, so the behavioral sciences or decision sciences, which kind of grew out of um, uh, the part that we're looking at, a group out of uh, Harvard and MIT, so Harvard, Rafa, mm -hmm. Ralph Keeney, a bunch of people, um, and were very much following their, their lead, that was really oriented towards either university students or businesses. So it's not very friendly when it comes to your, you know, your parents or teachers or your, your more ordinary, you know, ordinary citizen uh, right. who tends to be just as smart, but hasn't had the, the same training. Um, so I, I think um, there's just, there's a couple very fundamental thing. One is that most people when they make decisions, they focus on how the decision turned out. It was a good decision because mm -hmm. I carried an umbrella and it rained. It was a bad decision if I carried an umbrella and it didn't rain. And that has to do with outcomes uh, that we can't control. You know, I can't mm -hmm. control whether it rains or not. So I might make a really good decision, but it it doesn't fit with the outcome. So I think what Brooke and I wanted to do, and again, this follows um, a lot of work in the values focus of behavioral decision-making. Um, let's start with what the problem is and what, what matters in this context. What's important? What are the values? Mm -hmm. Rather than getting it backwards and starting with the alternatives. Um, you know, all of us have sat around a table and, and somebody says, well, should we do A or B? And it's like, I don't know, why, why would we do either one? What matters to us? What's important? So we've got we've got the cart before the horse. We've got the whole thing backwards, and I think that was maybe the strongest message of what we're doing is you've got to start by focusing on the right decision and really paying attention to your values, which is we'll talk about it later, I guess. But it's a lot harder than it might seem. And what do you think is the role that adults can play here when, I mean, people are still teenagers when it comes to supporting them and guiding them in their decisions with these decision maker moves in mind? One of the things that adults tend to do if they don't have the decision maker moves in mind is they will say, we'll go with your gut or um, they'll offer advice as to what they would do or they'll say, we'll think about it you know, really think about it, think about what you want to do. Um, and what the decision maker moves do is offer a uh, more uh, mentorship kind of mindset and role mm -hmm. so that the adult in the youth life can ask questions and not lead them to a particular answer, but um, help them develop those thinking skills and that practice of thinking deliberatively um, from a values-based beginning. And the thing that I really enjoy about it is that, um, you know, when we're, I have a 10 year old, she just turned 10 and a 13 year old, and um, I can do it really slyly. Like I don't have to make it a big event. I can just, yesterday we were literally walking to at the store and my daughter had a couple dollars. She was allowed to buy some candy with, and she was like, I've got to make the decision. Do I buy the, this candy or that candy? And I just, for kicks, um, use the decision maker moves with her. And it was really enjoyable because I got to see her thinking and I got to support her thinking. Um, and I, you know, it was a pretty safe choice to let her have full ownership over. So she got to live with the consequences of her choice, which is also a really good learning opportunity. So as a parent and also as a teacher, um, 
it's a really beautiful role to play when you can, when you can just be asking questions and not telling, you know, that there's space for them to develop who they are and through how they think. Um, and that's a, just a beautiful space to be. Cause there are I think, times. Yeah, the, curi well. the curiosity asking questions. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that was nice, Brooke is um, I think really key to what we're doing, because if you just, if you're a teenager and you're faced with a bunch of rules, do this, do that. Um, it, there's not much to be curious about. You kind of grudgingly do something. Um, whereas if you're in an environment that fosters curiosity, that's also curiosity about other people. So if you have, a, say, a small group of kids who are 14 or 15, one thing we'd really like to develop is having kids be curious about why others might see the world differently than them. You know, why Brooke's child's friend might want different candies than she wants. You know, like, what's going on? So you get this dialogue between people. And, you know, I think um, that dialogue, that kind of curiosity is so much missing among, much, you know, much of the adult world, if you look at the world of politics and what's going on. So I think if we can just a little tiny bit encourage that curiosity, compassion, mm -hmm. better listening among teenagers, maybe, 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 maybe the world will someday be a better place. So I think that's that's there too. And it can start with something as simple as, you know, take your $2 and go buy candy. Uh, you know, think about what you want and realize that you'll deal with the consequences. I think that's, it's a great lesson. So I imagine that when it comes to the bit about really having a good understanding that other people might think differently, might have other values, one goal here would also be to try to avoid a naive realism, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and misinformation, uh, which goes along with that. Uh, right. <laughs> so, and in what way should teenagers be given a voice in their choices? Because, of course, we shouldn't just let them do whatever they want, but to what extent? And, uh, I mean, it, how much should we listen to them and in what particular circumstances, let's say? I That's a that's a question that goes beyond again we we wrote a book about decision making and right. part of your question touches on um uh cultural backgrounds religious views mm -hmm. all sorts of things on which we are not experts um so i i'm I, go, you, I think uh, it'll, be, it'll be different yeah. for every every parent and every teacher, the degree of autonomy that they want to extend and space they want to extend to the to the youth in their lives or in their work. Um, so that question aside, that'll be a decision for every adult, but that question aside, once you do have some space where you decide to find as, as safe to play or, or um, that you're going to encourage, this is sort of like a, like a map to help you through that space. Um, because even in classrooms, like often, teachers, uh, when they're having a class make a decision, they'll resort to voting, right? We'll have a big vote. And what the decision maker moves do is create a space for thinking rather than taking sides. And um, and that has, in the classrooms that we've been able to witness it, been a really beautiful dialogue, like Robin mentioned earlier, where the discussion is, okay, well, if that really matters to you and this really matters to me, and we can both agree that they matter to the large group to some extent, um, how can we navigate our way through this? And, and it does um, create a space for perspective seeking um, rather than just perspective taking, like in a voting situation. So I think re regardless of the space or the length of, um, of rope you want to extend to the youth in your lives, this is a way to help you do that in a, in a really thoughtful way. Length of rope probably isn't the analogy we want, right? No, it's not a good one. No. <laughs> um, Brooke mentioned thinking, though, and and another basic thing is, and this goes back to um, work in the 90s in the behavioral sciences, and Danny Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, yes. the bestseller around the world, um, is that there has been also an emphasis on thinking and reflection, pause and reflect, you know, look before you leap. Um, actually, many, many of the decisions we make are powered by our emotions, our intuition, 
and are made extremely quickly. So something we try our best throughout the book to pay attention to is that um, there are these two modes of thinking. And one is very quick, very automatic, very fast. And the other one is much more reflective. So for a lot of the daily decisions, you're, you, go with, you go with your emotions, you go with your intuitions, uh, you have to. Um, but then for the more consequential decisions, we want, we want that, okay, let's think about what the, what's, what's going on, what are values, et cetera. So it's not, um, it's very different from say much of the critical thinking literature or other words like that, that are used in education in that it, it, we really do try to leave a, a, you know, a big place for that other, that other mode of thinking, the emotional, the intuitive. So you mentioned Daniel Kahneman there, and he, of course, did lots of work on biases and heuristics, for example. And in the book, you also talk about what you call decision traps. So what are these? And could you tell us a little bit about things like anchoring, numbing, availability, and the sort of effects they have on our decision making? Can I start this one, Robin, and then maybe you can finish it? Let's go for a couple hours here. This is a great topic. <laughs> <laughs> the decision traps is really what um, attracted me to this line of, of learning. Um, I certainly didn't know much about them beforehand, before meeting with Robin and working together. Um, mm -hmm. And it appealed to me because it's such a human way of moving through the world that we, um, that fast thinking brain trips us up all the time. And we use the term decision traps Um uh, there's a lot of other scientific words for it that Robin is much more familiar with, but the decision traps, because it's just this plain language way of thinking and our uh, way of talking about it. Yeah. But we see this all the time. And what we do in the book is we list some of the really common ones. What we do when we work in with people, with classrooms and with groups of teachers is um, I'll often put up a list of them and uh, I'll say which one resonates the most with you, which one is most familiar in your life. And after a few seconds of people looking at the list, they'll start giggling because all of them are very familiar to us because um, it's just how we're wired. And so um, we can see them, you know, in our own lives, but we can also see them in the headlines of media right now where and in our algorithms of social media where we've got um, in our social media feeds, the algorithms push people that think like us into our feeds. And so we sort of seek out um, to confirm our bias. Confirmation bias is one of those traps. And don't, without even knowing it, we become much more polarized in our, in our views and our spaces. And so the decision maker moves offers us a way of slowing down because it's not enough to say to somebody, we'll just slow down and think about it more. Um, the without any hand holding as to what to think about and ways of making that visible. And so the decision maker moves help you navigate through what could otherwise be um, many, many traps waiting for you in that fast thinking way. Yeah, so it, I do a lot of work um, helping governments make various decisions. Um, the same stuff comes up if I'm working with say senior government you know, or elected officials um, in that, the, yeah, these biases are just errors in decision-making that every human um, is prone to, uh, and knowing about them helps prevent them. So you mentioned like anchoring, anchoring is where a first impression or your sort of starting point then conditions everything else you think about something. Um, uh, so, so you anchor on that first impression, which means you're closing off to some later information that you get. Numbing is a, is a big one. Um, I think that uh, talking about social media in that I think it's very easy if we hear news, like hear news about the war in Ukraine, we hear day after day after day. And on the you know 78th day, when you read about something, how do you still contact that place in yourself to feel compassion for, for those people? Um, and how do you, how do you deal with, you know, large numbers? Um, if uh, if ten thousand people have been injured in an earthquake, well, it's actually you know it turns out to be twenty thousand. That's ten thousand more people who are inconvenienced or hurt or in the hospital. Or that's a huge number of people. So I think it's very hard for us to give meaning to um, meaning to larger numbers, meaning to ongoing events. 
and knowing that that's a tendency we have to become to become numb and numb and sort of shut it off i think we can work within ourselves we can work with other people we know to try to you know overcome that to fight against that um but if you're not aware of it then mm-hmm. then just kind of takes you over so that's the way it is with a lot of the more emotional intuitive um aspects of our thinking is that being aware of them as a trap as something that can lead you from making good decisions um is it it's not a cure it's not that the you know not that that possible bias or error goes away but it it helps you know how to kind of keep your humanity keep who you are as you go forward in the world i guess we also have to be aware of the bias blind spot right because uh, sometimes we might have that tendency that because we learned about the biases then we think that we are no longer susceptible to to them yes. but that is probably not the case right no there's a great interview with with uh, Dan, Dan Kahneman who's you know <laughs> certainly one of the world experts on decision making he <laughs> talks and laughs and laughs about stupid decisions that he still makes uh because of anchoring because of numbing and so on so yeah it's um I think we all we all make make those errors um which is part of again why it's it's good to have we talk a lot about working with others if I'm making a decision with Brook and I'm starting to to anchor on something or you know be prone to numbing Brook can remind me and say hey Robin you know here's look at what's going on so having that that collaboration mm-hmm. um is is often really helpful So that's really what? powerful with kids too and when you say mm-hmm. well who else is who else's opinion might you want to seek out on this or whose thinking isn't in the room right now um and that's important for adults as well um mm-hmm. but also when we're thinking about the health of our communities and we're making decisions as youth or as adults to think about whose voice isn't at the table is is a really key question um and the diversity of perspectives is actually a pretty powerful place to to move to you know move from when you're making that decision and so having those questions really readily available to you and and the more you practice the decision maker moves the more they are there um for you to draw from is a is a pretty powerful way to move and avoid some of those traps um but move mm-hmm. through them as well right so let's go through each of the decision maker moves then the first one is framing the decision could you perhaps give us uh, an example to illustrate it and when it comes to framing decisions which kinds of questions should be asked my favorite it's a very simple example but it seems to do the trick in sharing about the importance of framing the decision mm-hmm. is about um this example if i say should i cut my hair or not you know and people say well yes or no and then we i say well how many options are there like is that a very small scope or or a large scope people say well it's pretty small like you there's really only two options you cut it or you don't and then i just ask them to hold their hands there and say okay i'll give you another decision frame another way of framing that decision um how should i style my hair and suddenly and you know and everybody moves oh it's a bigger scope and so what happens as you increase the scope of your decision frame is that you increase the possibilities available to you and sometimes that's a great idea and sometimes it isn't but the the cool thing about working with kids is having them realize that whoever frames the decision holds the power and so when when adults are framing all of the decisions for kids they have very little agency um but if they have space to frame a decision then that gives themselves some owner more agency over their decision and as a result more um ownership over the consequences which is a really good thing for kids to learn early on so um the importance of choosing that scope really intentionally is is the first move because everything else will come from that we we use the analogy in the book of a uh, um using a camera so you can either zero in on just a small part of a picture or you can zoom out and get a much wider picture and i think human beings tend to sort of zero in but as a result you can miss a lot of consequences and particularly consequences that may not be happening right now but what happen later on i think it's part of the issue with climate change for example Mm-hmm. is it's it's hard to it's hard to think in the future because it's not right in front of you so enlarge the frame what's the problem you're looking at 
and think about long-term consequences. It, it, it can change, change our, our choices, change our decisions dramatically. Oh, you, you just froze, Robin. I'm sorry. Uh, oh. I was just waiting to see if you would come back. Oh, you're back now. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and the second move is about clarifying what matters. So what does that mean exactly? What is the process here? So in, a, in every decision, the, the, the reason why we want to make a choice is because something that we care about will be affected, will be impacted. If, um, you know, I may care a whole lot about whatever, my hair, as Brooke was just saying, but my hair isn't going to come into every decision because it's not going to be impacted. Um, but uh, that process of thinking, what is it that matters to me in this in this particular context? So again, in this context means you've, you've got that frame. Um, it's it's really important because the first things that come to mind may be things about myself, but right behind that will be oh what what about my family what about my friends what about my neighborhood, so it, you you think about okay what really is at play here in this decision, and and what matters and there's um interestingly there's a lot of behavioral decision research, showing that even you know professional decision makers CEOs and companies that kind of thing, usually um only are aware of about half of their objectives. So if you if you ask people to go, you go around a room with adults or with teenagers and ask people to write down what matters to you about, you know, where we go for a, a year end celebration of our sixth grade class or what we want to care about, you know, with Toyota in terms of designing a new car. Um, those professional decision makers will only think about maybe half of the things, 40% of the things that are important. So you go around a room and different people think of different things. And it's like, oh yeah, that that thing is also important to me. I didn't think about that. Oh yeah, that. Uh, so the process of supporting teenage decision-making, that's the subtitle of the book, um, is really encouraging um, that teenager to explore who he or she or they are. You know, what is it? that makes that teenager that uh, that special person and what matters to them. So it's it's uh, it's not just sort of looking forward to the decision and consequences, but it's also very much uh, looking internally, um, you know, who am I? And at age 14, 15, or at age 70, I think those are questions we should all be asking ourselves. Who am I? So what matters to me? It's kind of the same thing. Who am I? What matters to me? And I guess this takes us back to the fact that this is a values-based approach because, uh, I mean, to go through all of these decision-maker moves, we have to uh, keep in mind what uh, our values are, what the teenagers' values are and their goals, right? I mean, this is, it, it, it has a very big element of subjectivity to it, mm -hmm. right? Well, and and te and there's a tension there too, which we talk about a little bit in the book. But you know, what if you have a 14 year old uh, as as your child, and their values are quite different from your own, right? Uh, as you know, as the parent or as a teacher. Um, so how how do you handle that? How do you work with that dynamic? And you know, on what occasions is it okay? On what occasions is it is it not okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing, actually, for people who work, say, for a large company, and there's goals of the company, and there's their own individual goals. And how do they, how do they adjust those two in balance? Or people in a relationship, you know, the the two people in a relationship may not always agree. So um, it, I think that's it's that tension mm -hmm. because you know I know if we go deeply enough, Ricardo, you and I would have some you know some differences of opinion on things, but. Does that affect our friendship? Does that our ability to work together? So it's I think that's it's a fascinating thing. It's not something um, not something to be avoided, not something to pretend it isn't there. Uh, but we really feel like it's important for those values to, to come forward and to be discussed. And if you do want to support your teenage decision maker, um, it's important to help help them clarify their values and who they are. And about the third move, 
how do we generate options? How do we go about it? Uh, well, one of the ways with kids is is brainstorming. And um, there are a lot of strategies, like that's a pretty common strategy for teachers to use and brainstorm. Um, but once you get beyond the obvious sort of choice uh, options that come to mind, um, to go a little bit deeper and really probe that is important. So we offer a lot of different questions that can help with that and some exercises in the book that can help with that. Um, but perspective seeking is a really big part of that. So to avoid those um, confirmation bias and other other decision making traps, to say like, well, what would so and so suggest, or or um, whose voice are we missing here? What can they offer? Because tapping into that creative brain, and this is the really creative thinking space, um, it's so important to go beyond the obvious because um, that is a trap that our our system, our fast thinking system, will lead us into. Mm. And, and once you, you once you know your objectives, once you know what matters, mm -hmm. it totally mm -hmm. changes that search for alternatives because then you're coming up with you're trying to come up with alternatives which help achieve your objectives. If you don't know there are those objectives, you kind of don't have a roadmap. Why would one alternative be better than another? Who knows? But if you can link them back to achieving objectives, I think you've got a, a much more solid basis for 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 choosing an action. And why is it so important for us to generate different options? What is the role that that specific step plays in decision making? Having um, one of the common places where people start a decision making process without the decision maker moves is that they'll start with the options and they'll mm -hmm. say, like, you know, where are we going to go on vacation or what are we who, you know, all sorts of things that come up and we sort of often lock ourselves into a binary or into a limited set of options. And so um, having a more expansive approach, beginning first with a, a frame and then thinking about what matters, make sure that our options are grounded in those two places. And that's a much more helpful starting place because um, it gives us a much um, more grounded beginning place, but also a more meaningful one. So maybe the options that come to mind before we've used the decision maker moves aren't even relevant in the end, once we've gone through it and having that uh, lens of what really matters in this context before we start imagining what might be possible, make sure that we're moving in the in the right direction for, for this context. So generating options, um, sometimes it goes really quickly and sometimes it's really tough because we're really locked into our initial thinking or, or we don't have enough perspectives in the room. Um, but it's so important because otherwise we've limited ourselves unnecessarily and, and this and this really is the where creativity comes in uh, big time so you can you can really um and it's fun you can see groups um you know groups of kids groups of adults when they actually start thinking outside the box or when they enlarge the size of the box it gets so excited and starts sort of jumping up and down and smiling and it's like oh yeah there's something we hadn't thought of before that would be a great thing to do. So let's do it. So it's it's an it's a, it's like sort of a payback part. It's very exciting. And about the move of exploring consequences, I mean, what kinds of consequences should teenagers consider here? Because I, I mean, even for adults, many times it is very hard for us to really figure out what are all the likely consequences and the ones that are really hard to predict beforehand, right? One of the nice ways about, oh, sorry, Robin. No, I'll you just go. say something quick here, but um, the nice part about this for me is that it, it cuts down on the overwhelm because in the decision maker moves, you look at each option and the consequence mm -hmm. on each of the values. And so I don't have to think about the whole big picture. I can just go very methodically um, how will this option impact this value and how will it impact another the other value and so on? And so that really helps, especially um, with adults or kids, but it just helps to take a step back and, and think about it really deliberatively in pieces before we look at the whole. Mm -hmm. And you're also thinking here of, in, in terms of consequences, there's two other things that always come up. One is that question of the frame. Am I looking at consequences over the next day, over the next week, over the next month? Uh, and I think that's a really big one for teenagers because some things that for a teenager that may be very attractive in the moment for the next couple hours, go to that party, 
you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if they think about the longer term consequences, maybe, maybe that, maybe something different will happen. So it's partly that side. And the other side is uncertainty in that thinking forward to consequences involves uncertainty and making predictions. And uh, that's a, you know, that's not something that, that anyone does hugely well. So I think it, it involves that element of uncertainty. Where do you get your information? And what do you do given that looking forward, um, you know, you're making predictions, but they may or may not happen. And I mean, of course, as you mentioned there, there are different kinds of consequences. Some of them are perhaps more short term, others mm -hmm. long term. And maybe, I mean, in certain specific cases, situations where maybe we might be thinking about short term consequences, if they are just short term, short term and not a big deal, maybe we can just not uh, give too much thought to at least mm -hmm. those ones, right? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's there's certain consequences. I mean, if you think about waiting or or paying attention to consequences, mm -hmm. some consequences are really minor. And so yeah. you don't have to put much attention on that. Yeah. But other consequences may have much, much more long lasting or mm -hmm. maybe they affect other people. You know, it's not just what affects me, but how can my decisions affect others? Um, so yeah, that's that's, part of where the individual um, develops that subjective judgment about what is it that they're going to pay uh, particular attention to. And, and, and it may be that they also want to go out and get more information. Like, you know, why isn't that, what's an example? Buying a used car. And I want to think about, oh, I don't want a car that's going to take a lot of repair work on down the line. And so I have to compare two or three or four different models of cars. I, I, I need to go out and collect some information. Where do I go to get that information? What's a trusted source? Um, and it may be that after hearing, you know, the repair bills from three or four cars, I think, oh, I don't know, I'm not actually going to get a car. I'm just going to stick with a bus. Um, but it's that it's like, so there's a lot involved in that, in that uh, consequence step. And part of, part of the neat thing about seeing that in a classroom too, is that, it becomes a research project, which is much more meaningful than mm -hmm. like a book report because kids are posing their own questions and then they have to seek that information and highlighting that uncertainty and then navigating through it is a pretty powerful practice mm -hmm. for kids to be, to be working on. Mm -hmm. And they're, and they're following that line of thought because something matters to them. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's pretty cool. It's kind of engages kids in a different way. And like Brooks said right at the beginning, they don't have to know that they're working on decision maker move number four. I couldn't care less about that. But but they're what they're doing is they're taking in like, you know, eating a food, they're taking in this mm -hmm. process and into their body. And if they use it on a couple school projects, hopefully they'll use it on something out of school as well. How about weighing trade off? I mean, what are the perhaps the aspects that are important to consider here? I'll take a first shot. That that gets back to thinking about consequences again. In that, you know, the different consequences of different actions. Um, you, I have to think. Well, if I do if I do A, it's going to be great in the short term, lousy in the long term. If I do B, yeah. it's just the reverse. So then I have to. I can't. I can't have the best of both. So what do I what do I want to do? Maybe I can construct a new alternative, but um, it, it's really thinking uh, that there's there's nothing that's going to satisfy all of my values, all of my objectives, absolutely perfectly. So I have to make a choice. Well, what's most important, and you know what what do I have the most opportunity to actually follow up? Perhaps where where is the uncertainty the lowest? So you know you start you start realizing that um, there aren't binary choices, but even if you have like five or six or seven different options, they all probably have some sort of golden side, some really neat part. But then they have some downside. So how do you how do you live with that? How do you adjust to that? And most of the things that we want to do, um, because we want to do them, also have a downside. You want to be on a sports team because you love soccer. But that means you have to 
exercise and work. You know, you want to whatever, be a chef at a restaurant, but that means you're not going to get much sleep for your first couple of years. So it's that kind of thing. And how do you how do you make those trade-offs and f- and feel okay with them? You know why you're doing it because you want whatever that benefit is. And I would imagine that at a certain point, because we have different values and maybe perhaps in different situations, we would prioritize different sets of values over others. At a certain point, we just have to go and make a decision because otherwise we could be here ad infinitum considering <laughs> possible consequences and trying to trade off between different values and objectives, uh, right? I mean, there, there, it comes, there comes a point where we just have to go ahead with the decision, right? You sound like a national government. There's that's a real problem with a lot of big national government decisions. <laughs> is that they try so hard to get everybody's views that you know, six or seven or eight years later, they're still working on the decision. Sorry, Brooke. I th- think I cut you off there. No, you didn't. You didn't. I was just thinking of a story about a grade six, seven class, Joanne Calder's classroom, a teacher we work with quite often here, and. Um, her students were trying to decide how they should organize the chairs in the room, where the desks mm-hmm. should all be. And if you're 12, that seriously matters to you. Like you have a lot invested in where you're going to be sitting for a few weeks in your classroom. So they had come down to a couple of options and the class was super happy kind of with either one. They would accept either one. Uh, nobody was opposing it except for these two boys who did vociferously oppose both options. And in a fit of frustration after you know trying to come to, cons- to consensus for so long one of the kids said to the to the boys like what is it going to take to get you to agree to one of these options and the boys offered a tweak on one of the options and that ended up satisfying the whole class and they all moved on quite happily um, with full understanding about why they were all sitting where they were sitting and they had ownership in that um piece of building their classroom community. And so it's a very simple example, but when you're 12, those stakes are really high and they were able to move through a dialogic process that in the end, the trade-offs were ones that they could all deal with um, and they could be in community with one another. And so that's that's a pretty big piece of it is knowing what trade-offs are you willing to make and, and which are like a non-starter. And then if you have some that are you know, you can accept both options, then it's, um, you go into that with a sense of clarity that otherwise you might miss. Whenever you say the word dialogic, I think, boy, this person is really smart. <laughs> <laughs> I think that well, Brooke, about you Brooke, all the time. <laughs> Brooke was just talking about ownership and, you know, that's, yeah. I think we use the word agency, but agency, ownership, like how many teenagers have ownership, feel they have ownership over their lives? I think, you know, a lot, a smaller percentage than I would, than I would like to see. But can I back up just for a moment? Because yes, sure. a couple, a couple things there have, one is that when we talk about trade-offs, trade-offs is, a, is kind of a nasty word, right? It's like, oh, I have to face trade-offs and you sort of get that depressed feeling. Um, but that actually is true of decision-making generally. Like we have to make a decision. It's like, you know, there's sort of a tension involved with that. And I think one of the messages that Brooke and I are really trying to emphasize through the whole book is that actually your decisions are opportunities. Decisions are are opportunities to express who you are, to change your little bit of the world. Um, and and so there's sort of, a, there's an excitement about decision-making that, um, that only comes if you see it as opportunities rather than as solving a problem. And then there's another problem. They aren't problems, they're opportunities. Um, and I think that also comes very strongly out of the negotiations literature. There's a lot of what we do that was co-developed with people who do um, negotiations work, books like Getting the Yes, uh, in terms of getting people to work together to make decisions and to face to face trade-offs and to realize that by doing that, um, new new opportunities will open up. So, it's an exciting thing. It's not a 
it's not a dismal science. It's an exciting thing. Economics can be the dismal science, but I think decision decision making is an exciting science. <laughs> And I guess that with that idea in mind that it is an exciting thing to do, we get into the last decision maker move that is about staying curious and adjusting. So what is this really about? What does it mean to stay curious and adjusting if necessary? Okay. Um, I often talk about this with, with students in terms of... Um, not getting too attached to something or being mm -hmm. stuck with a decision just right. because you made it. And that is a, a decision trap that we fall into quite naturally. Well, I've already, you know, spent this much money on the choice I made. Now I'm stuck with it. Um, and that might be true sometimes, but to recognize when it isn't true and when you are able to be flexible and adapt is, is really crucial. I would really love kids leaving our school system to go out into the world knowing that sometimes they are going to need to change their mind and that changing your mind is a uh, marker of intelligence and adaptive adaptivity. And those are not things to fear. It's be when we become too entrenched in our thinking that, that we can run into trouble um, as community and as individuals. So um, circumstances are going to change. And so the, the decision that you made might've been right last year and now it's different and you need to make moves to adjust to that and especially when they are leaving school and maybe thinking about what they're going to do after they graduate um kids are not forced into but sort of pressured to make all these really big decisions like what post-secondary education am i going to engage in or program or not and if i you know enroll in this program two years down the road i realize i don't want to do that for the rest of my life Am I able to change? And sometimes changing your mind is a privilege, but to know when it is and when you can take advantage of that is, is really important. And I would imagine that this has a lot to do with the fact that there's a lot of, always a lot of uncertainty when it comes to our decision making, right? Even mm -hmm. when considering the consequences and weighing the trade-offs, I mean, things happen and i guess that in this particular point probably the stoics would be right when they told us that we should care about what we can control but not about mm -hmm. what we can't control because can't there's control. a huge amount of stuff out there that we can't really control and sometimes even uh, what appears to be a perfect plan just goes off the rails because of something that we couldn't uh, mm -hmm. know of right yeah and, and if you're, I mean, we all have constraints on us, but Brooke and I happen to live in a, in a place where, where people, you know, most people generally have a fair amount of freedom. Not everybody in the world does that. Yeah. So um, if you uh, lack education, if you're poor, uh, maybe the cultural environment in which you live, um, you're, you're in terms of changing your mind, doing something different, there, there's probably more constraints perhaps on you. And so we're, we're realizing, you know, we, we are aware of the fact that the adjustments you make might be, you know, might be smaller. You still have choices, you still have decisions, but it's probably a more constrained world that you live in than what most of the teenagers we work with live in. But of so, course, but, it, it is one thing for things to go unexpectedly wrong. But what about mistakes? How should mm -hmm. teenagers deal with mistakes? I was thinking about mistakes. I think that's one of the roles we haven't specifically used this term, but the decision mentor, uh, which we talk a lot about in the book, the person, the adult who is working with the teenagers could be a parent, grandparent, friend, aunt, uncle, uh, teacher, cousin, yeah. coach. Um, but I think that the adult is, as I think, in a in a really special position here with respect to mistakes, because um, I think we all learn from our mistakes, uh, but we don't want to make you know horrible mistakes. We don't want to make mistakes that are life threatening. We don't want to mis mm -hmm. make mistakes that will carry the scars <laughs> over the rest of our lives. And so I think that that's a real important role for the adult. Um, you know, making choices about careers, but also things like, um, you know, sports and, and just kind of keeping, 
keeping track of what's a safe zone so that uh, a teenager can learn through their mistakes and realize, oh, I shouldn't have done that, or I, you know, should have warmed up first or, you know, whatever it is, but make those mistakes so that they are learning opportunities that then um, the teenager can move forward from those. Um, but I, I think seeing mistakes as, I think it's good to make mistakes because there are learning opportunities, uh, but we want to make sure that uh, those mistakes happen within an environment where um, you, you retain that flexibility and you can sort of move forward having learned something, having him known something. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes perfect sense. And uh, I mean, j just before we go, would you like to perhaps leave us with a final, with some final thoughts, a final message, particularly for teenagers that even for us as adults, sometimes uncertainty when making decisions is very scary and even more so for teenagers who even know less about the world than we do and they are very uncertain about everything and even their own values and so on. So what would be a positive final message here for the teenagers when dealing with things like uncertainty? I think one of the most powerful things for me in this work is seeing youth develop who they are mm -hmm. through the questions that the decision maker moves ask of them. And then taking that thinking and that knowledge and taking action with it so that they begin to move through the world in a way that um in a way that has integrity for them that's pretty pretty powerful because i think kids i mean kids today are definitely dealing with a lot of uncertainty yeah. and there's you know there's a lot of fear wrapped up in that for them like on the big global scale there there's a ton of uncertainty about our world and and certainly youth in North America are feeling that um, given the data. So in that place, it's nice to have a map and it doesn't reduce or eliminate the uncertainty, but it helps them feel um, like they know a, know a way to move through it and to navigate through that uncertainty as opposed to, you know, stopping to think or just what, 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 what am I going to do? Like, Here's some smaller piece questions, piece by piece, that you can take as you move through you know, those those choices. Uh, and so one of the things like we do in the book is for each of the moves, we try to um, provide some very practical tips mm -hmm. um, that uh, to kind of operationalize, be very practical, so that we aren't just talking in theories, but very practical steps. The book also has a lot of stories. Brooke and I both believe very strongly in the power of stories. Um, but I, I, I think in terms, I think one of the things that teenagers I know, many of the adults I know, um, they don't quite know how to engage in the world, in this world of ours. Like, how do they connect with the world? Um, and I think the, the way to engage is through your choices. So if you get better at making choices, that gives you new opportunities for engagement and for finding out about yourself. Because um, I think adults tend to know more about the world than teenagers, but the teenagers know more about themselves. The teenagers are the ones that, that, who know about themselves. So if we can activate that, um, you know, we, we need their input. We need, we, we need the input. My generation hasn't done a fantastic job at, at uh, you know, being in the world and being on our planet. I think we need the input, creative input of those those uh, kids between you know twelve and twenty five, um, and their values, and and see what kind of world they can shape. So I think anything we can do to encourage that will have the side benefit it, as they get engaged. I think that fear, the depression, the feeling of being a little bit overwhelmed at the world, it's likely to to go down because they're engaged, because they're seeing that ownership that uh, that we talked about earlier. So. Very simple thing, making good choices, but supporting the choices that uh, that teens make based on their values. 
Great. So the book is again sorting it out, supporting teenage decision making. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. And uh, Dr. Gregory and Moore, uh, would you also like to tell the audience where they can find your work on the internet? <laughs> You can find but it. Pu most it's published by Cambridge, Cambridge University Press. Um, and it's also, I think it's available through many of, of the big, the big outlets. Uh, and through uh, you know, a lot of people have bookstores in their neighborhood. And I think and it should be available through those bookstores as well. Uh, yes, but I, I was also asking about your other work. I mean, where people can find you and ah. your other work on the internet. We uh, we both have websites that we're linking things like that too. So mm -hmm. you can look up brookmore.ca or robingregory.ca, I believe, Robin, and uh, mm -hmm. and go about it that way. Pretty Great. easy to find, I think. Yeah, and, so, uh, and, and maybe yeah. and go through us to the sort of network. We both have a lot of collaborators. Like Brooke has mentioned, some of these amazing teachers in Delta. You know, we both have amazing colleagues. Uh, there's a group at uh, University of British Columbia we work with, um, Judy Halbert, Linda Kayser. So you know, we're 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 embedded in a really great group of people. So it's it's not just us. It's it's uh, it's quite a quite a bunch of really cool collaborators. Great. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for the opportunity, Ricardo. Yeah, thanks, Ricardo. You're a great interviewer, by the way. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. And also please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perorgo Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Ruinassi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Phil Kavanagh, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andre, Francis Forti, Agnun, Svergor Kossen, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Labrant, John Nyars, Tantan T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Leira, Tom Hamel, Sardis, France, David Sloan, Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Dan Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavla Stazewski, Nelek Bakka, Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, George Theophanes, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles de Moray, Alex Shaw, Maury Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilly Jr., Old Erringbone, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dovner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowley, Kate Van Goller, Alexander Hubbard, uh, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hertner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings, David Pinsoff, Sean Nelson, Mike Lavigne, and Dios Necht. A special thanks to my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egden, Bernard Igni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Alni Cortiz and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadrian, Bogdan Canivets and Rosie. Thank you for all.